Hello. Hello. Okay. Um. Um. You should see my desktop right now. Is that? Um. Can people see my desktop? Yes. Okay. Yep. Good. Um. I'm not getting a list of who's in the class yet. I'm. 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 Uh, I'm not sure how many people are here yet. Um. Let's see. Oh, okay. 32 people here so far. Okay, that's pretty close to everyone. Okay, well, welcome to, to the operating systems course. This should be CS302. Okay. Okay. Uh, and what we're going to run the classes, uh, mostly I'm going to spend a lot of time running programs and showing you demonstrations of things. So, so I'm going to just start the course. Instead of you seeing my face, you're going to see my desktop. And I'll be running a lot of programs and we'll be working with some code and we'll be doing a lot of watching what Windows does. Okay, now. Uh, here's the website for this class. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is, is go over the website for the course and the syllabus. Okay, oh, actually, let me just start off first. Does anybody got a question? Is there anything that anybody wanna ask right away before we get started? Any concerns, any problems, anything that needs to be brought up? Oh, and um, I'm sitting here at a computer, a, a, a laptop, and it's got, I got two monitors. My main monitor that I'm looking at is the one that's showing my desktop to what you're seeing. If you raise your hand using the Zoom app, I probably won't notice it because that's off on a monitor on my side. If you've got a question anytime during the class, just, just interrupt. Just, you know, don't, you know, feel comfortable just saying, you know, just saying, you know, you want to ask a question or something. Just interrupt me if you if you have a question or, or if you have a concern about something. Because if you raise your hand using the little, uh, like, button on Zoom, I probably won't see it. Because it, it's way off to my right on my, you know, I, it's, it's out of the my peripheral vision. Okay. And I don't know a way to uh, have that show up on my desktop while we're, we're doing work. I don't think that would actually be a great idea. So, so if you have any questions at all, please just interrupt. Okay, so now here's the website for the course. Most of the material, actually all the material for the course will be on the website, not in Brightspace. The only thing we'll be using Brightspace for is you'll submit homework assignments on Brightspace. Okay, so the main page of the, of the website is this page here called Lectures and Readings. That's gonna be an entry for every day and it'll be what the reading assignment is for the day, uh, what wh when a homework assignment is announced. Like you're gonna have your first homework assignment will be available real soon. I, I was hoping it would be available today, but I wasn't able to finish writing it up last night. So um, maybe it'll be up there tonight. And see, here's the page where there are all the homework assignments. Like right now, that's blank. It, it, there, it, the homework assignment's not up there yet. So I'll put an announcement up here when I get the homework assignment ready. And, and so this will announce when there's a homework assignment, but you can go straight to the homework assignment page too. And you can just check it. If the homework assignment's there, you'll see it there. Okay, so for example, uh, we're gonna start talking about processes and C programming. Processes is, is a topic in operating systems. So you have a reading assignment for the first chapter of our operating systems textbook, and you have a reading assignment from the first chapter of a C textbook. So we'll, I'll show you a little bit more about those in a minute, but that's what we're going to start with. We're going to start, we're talking about processes from operating systems and C programming. Okay. Then the other important page is the syllabus. Okay. This is the syllabus for the class. Uh, this is our main textbook and it's an online book. Okay. This is the, the website for the book. These are all the chapters of the book. Like your first reading assignment is this chapter here. And each chapter is a PDF document. You, you can download it. You can read it online. You could download it and print it out. They print out pretty nicely. Uh, as far as I know, the guys the, who wrote this never made an e-reader version of these. Like, I don't think you can read these on a Kindle. I don't think he has a version for Kindles and, and things like that. But everything is, each chapter is one PDF document. Okay. And, and they're easy enough to read on a, on a laptop or a, a tablet, they're probably not very easy to read on a phone, but you can read them on a laptop or a tablet or you can download them and print them out. Okay, so that's the textbook. And then we're gonna be programming in C. These are all 
various references to the C programming language. None of them are great, but as taken together, we can learn enough about C. I mean, there's no one really good C book that's free. There are very good C books, but they're expensive. So these are all free online C books. And all as, as a group all together, there's a lot of good information in them and they're um, good re references. I wish there was one really good free C book. Like this operating systems book is as good as any operating systems book on the market. It's as well written as any of the books that you have to pay for. It's a it's written by a very well known researcher at University of Wisconsin. It, it, it's a good book. These C books are um, like this. Uh, let's see. One of the books we'll be using is this one. This book was written 40 years ago, but it's still a halfway decent book on C, but it's really old. And the person who uh, wrote it, uh, it's out of print, so they made it available online. This is another example of a book that was in print and then it was it went out of print and now it's been made available online. This is a real good reference book. This is a very good book, not for so much learning. You wouldn't read this book cover to cover, but it's a really good reference book to just look up a topic and read a section of it at a time. Okay, so there's a, 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 a we'll, 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 I'll give you individual reading assignments out of these different books from time to time, and we'll look at uh, sections of them. But if you're, if you want to dig in, um, like I say, this one is a reference book. This is the one that you have your first reading assignment for. Um, like this is a short one that's real nice. This is like, you know, it's only 26 pages. It's a nice, short, quick overview. And also it's written for Java programmers. You may be more comfortable with Java. You've probably done more homework assignments in Java than in C or C++. So several of these references know that. So they're saying, here's how to, here's, here's how to explain C if you already know Java. So uh, notice that there's three of them like that. C for Java programmers. And then here's another one, C for Java programmers. Oh, this one actually costs a dollar. This one's not free. I like this one a lot, but it's not free, but it costs one dollar. And, and if you if you're curious and you want to spend a dollar, I, I think it's actually quite a nice book. It's well worth a dollar, but it's the only one of them that's not a, a free download. OK, but there's three of them that are called C for Java programmers. OK. Um, this one takes a little while to download. I'm not sure why. I think the, the server is just not as uh, uh, fast, but it's a uh, it's actually written as a book on C for people who are doing Raspberry Pi programming. But it's a pretty nice little introduction to C. It takes a long time for it to. So, I mean, if you want it, you know, you download it once and then you have it on your computer. Okay. But it was actually written by people who do Raspberry Pi programming, so it makes a lot of. See, it's from the uh, Raspberry Pi group okay and it's a it's a nice little introduction to the c uh it's got a nice chapter on pointers uh it's got a nice chapter on strings okay so and it's a it's a nicely done book it's it's a nice looking book and um i think this one here is another oh this is another older book this is another one that's it, it, more of a reference book yeah uh it's got a few good chapters in it and we'll Here's the actual book. I'll, I'll give you at certain points. I'll, I'll point you to certain places in this book where there are good explanations of specific ideas. So, OK, so a bunch of books on C and one book on operating systems. That's what we're going to be working with. OK, and then uh, for the course, you're going to have the, the course is based on two exams and programming assignments. The, exa the programming assignments are worth half your your grade and the two exams are each worth a quarter of your grade. Uh, the first exam is tentatively set for Wednesday, March 9th. If everything goes OK, we'll have the exam on Wednesday, March 9th. If something goes wrong, if we get a snow blizzard and we get pushed, you know, we lose some days, maybe that'll get postponed. But right now it's it's tentatively set for uh, March 9th. It'll be in class exam, pretty much like exams. If you had Java or data structures, me, it will be an in class exam that you write your answers on it on the on, on a sheet of paper. There, the two exams are equal weight. The second exam will be during final exam week, but it's not gonna be a final exam. It'll be an exam on the second half of the semester, but it'll be during final exam week. 
OK, so exam one will be the first half of the semester. Exam two will be the second half of the semester and exam two will be when we have uh, will be during the final exam week. OK, then you're going to have a, a number of programming assignments. Usually it's around five or six programming assignments for the semester. OK, and. Then, you know, all together, they're going to be worth 50 percent of your score. Uh, there, you know, there's a paragraph here pointing out that. Uh, oh, in this class, I think it's OK. The, the homework assignments here tend to be a little bit harder. In, in some other of the classes, and you can work with a partner. Two people can work together on these programming assignments. So in this class, now that's two people, not not teams of ten or twelve people. So two people can work together on a program assignment. When you, if you work together with program assignment, as it points out here, please both people submit the homework, but with two, with two names on it. If only one person submits the homework, I may not, I may not record a grade for the other person. Yeah, especially if one person submits it and doesn't have the other person's name on it. If you work with a partner, both people should home, turn in the homework assignment and both should put their name on. They should put both names on, on the homework assignment. You'll be submitting your homework assignments to Brightspace. So you'll be uploading them as zip files to Brightspace. OK, and for the most part, this this, this all the wording here is pretty standard about uh, homework assignments. You're supposed to do your own work. In this case, a pair of programmers are supposed to do their own work. You're not supposed to share work with other people. You can talk about, I, mean, I really think it's a good idea you talk about homework assignments with people. Uh, if, if somebody knows a good reference on where to get a good idea, if, if somebody can explain an idea to a friend, I mean, it's not wrong to talk about this stuff, but you shouldn't be copying code from each other. You know, people shouldn't just be handing around a program and then just making changes to the variable names and submitting it. It's not going to be helping you if you do that. You, know, you want to be able to actually write the code for these things because there's a lot to learn in this. We're going to we're going to be writing fairly low level code that has C talk to an operating system. It's really interesting kind of code. It's very different than what you'll see in other classes, and it, it's well worth what worth, worth learning. It, you know, it's it's this is your course where you learn what we we usually call systems level programming. The, the level of programming where you're you're talking to the operating system, your program is communicating with the operating system. So it's generically referred to as systems level programming. This is the course where we cover that. And it's it's a fairly interesting, pretty challenging kind of, of, of programming. OK, so. All the homework assignments will be written in C uh, in a little bit. I'll show you how to compile C programs. I'll, I'll show you a system for uh, compiling C programs that we'll use for this course. OK, and the other thing that we're going to talk a lot about besides operating systems and C programming, we're going to talk a lot about the command line interface. OK, the whole idea of an, uh, it turns out that the operating system, I'll show you this in a little while. You're used to this desktop and all this stuff here is being the, the this is what you think of as Windows. And it turns out that's not really accurate. The, the, this stuff is not really Windows. The Windows operating system is something far more lower level than all this desktop stuff. And, the actual operating system really is based around the command line. The command line is really crucial to understanding how operating systems work. That's more emphasized with the Linux world, it's, it, but it's also important for Windows too. The Windows operating system is a command line operating system. It's actually not a GUI operating system. It's a command line operating system with a GUI on top of it. So all the, the desktop stuff you see here, all of this is actually, uh, added to the operating system. In fact, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later. I can actually, I can kill the desktop. I can get rid of it. You know, the desktop is not really part of Windows. I can, you can, I can make it go away. The, the command line is the heart of the operating system. So we're going to be talking about operating systems and how C programs talk to operating systems. And we're going to see how to make use of the command line to work, to do our C programming and get information about the operating system. Okay. So those are like the three main topics of the course, operating systems, C programming, and command line interface. Okay. And later on in the course, we'll also start talking a little bit about Linux. Most of what we're gonna be doing is with C, but uh, Windows now comes with Linux built in. Uh, it, Microsoft's done something really amazing in the last two years. They've essentially built a version of Linux directly into Windows. It's called Windows Subsystem for Linux. And It's this thing here, it's Windows subsystem for Linux. This is the page that explains how to install it. We'll play around with it. It, uh, it. 
if you have Windows 11, by, if anybody has Windows 11, I think it's already installed in Windows 11. And if you have Windows 10, you need to add it to a Windows, but it's, a, it's not very hard to add it. But it, it, it gives you Linux side by side with Windows. And that's really great for a course like this, because then we can compare and contrast the, the two different operating systems in a really convenient way. We don't need virtual machines and all kinds of uh, complicated things. The, the Linux will just be sitting part, of, it's just part of Windows now. Okay, okay. so that's the syllabus for the class, okay. Um, oh, and we're gonna meet online hopefully for only three weeks. Yeah, hopefully this is, we'll just be only doing this for three weeks and then we'll be back in the classroom uh, at, at, in, in a few weeks. Anybody got any questions so far? Any questions come up about like uh, the, the exams or the homeworks or anything like that? Apologies, Professor. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh huh. I was just going to say, as it pertains to partners and whatnot, um, as, do you care if uh, we have the same partner throughout the semester? Does that matter? No, no. If, if, if you work with one person on one homework assignment and then you decide you don't like the person, you want to work with somebody else, or, you know, no, no, you, know, you don't have to like a, pick a partner for the whole semester. As far as I'm concerned, it's I think if two people want to work together on a program, and you don't have to have a partner. I mean, in in, in the past, many people chose to do the homework assignments on their own. So yeah, you know, it's just that on any given homework assignment, two people can work together. Okay, and you don't have to tell me ahead of time. When you just when you submit them, if you work with somebody, put your name and their name as part of the homework assignment when you submit it. You know, and and, be, and both persons should submit together. You know, both persons submit it because otherwise I'll, I'm I'm likely to not make I may I may not make an entry in the in the grade book for one of you. So both people should just turn it in. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Any any other questions so far? And I'm recording this. So and I'll try after class to put it up on um on on YouTube. So uh, the, I'll, I'll try to put the request, I, I was able to do that last year. I, I forgot how to do it. I have to remind myself how to go back and do that now. But uh, with, with any luck after class, I'll, I'll upload the video from this class to, Bright, uh, to uh, YouTube, okay? And then I'll put a link on it uh, on, the, on, this, on this page here. Like here's the link to the meeting. Then I'll replace this link to the meeting with a link to the video. So after class, if I get the video uploaded to YouTube pro successfully, I'll replace this part here with a link to today's video, okay? And then, then on Wednesday, there'll be a new link to join the class, and then I'll replace that with the video after class, okay? All right, so now uh, back to this page here. Here's, this is the page that explains what we do each day. This is the page you wanna look at the most often. Uh, the reading assignment is to read the first six pages of this. This is an overview of the whole course. So this is the introductory chapter of the textbook, and it's an overview of the whole course. The part that we're really going to be doing in the next couple of weeks is the first six pages of this. So read the first six pages. You can read the rest if you want. It's an interesting uh, introduction to operating systems. But the first six pages give you a good sense of what we're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. So read the first six pages of that. And then this is what we're really going to be doing, this chapter here, the pr process. So we'll, we'll talk more about it on Wednesday. So the reading assignment is to read about this thing about process. I'll, I'll introduce the idea today a little bit, and, but read the details of it uh, in the next couple of days. And then for C programming, you, you had CS124, which is a C++ class. Everything about C, well, C is a part of C++. Okay. What we're gonna emphasize in this course is the parts of C that are really needed for systems programming. So we're not going to sit and talk about while loops and for loops and if statements in C. We're going to be talking, when we do talk about C, it's mostly going to be about input and output and pointers and struts. So input, output, pointers, and struts are going to be the, the key ideas of C that are subtle and hard that we're going to spend time talking about. Now, this chapter is an introduction to C. You see, it's just called basic concepts. It's a long chapter, 60 pages. So you might just want to start reading this. Uh, I, if you feel, if you feel comfortable with C, you you know you may not need to read much of this. Um, most of this is pretty low level. Most of this is very introductory stuff. 
So at this point, the book is talking about while loops, for loops, uh, variables and things like that. So it, it's for the most part, it, this is should be very much review. OK, so I just made a, a reading assignment. Uh, as we go along and we get to harder parts to see, then we'll we'll look at more specific reading assignments to talk about pointers, input, output, struts, the things that are the most tricky parts to see that we'll need to learn about. OK, all right. All right. Now and then this zip file has got some code. If I click on this, I download the zip file. Um, see, it's downloading slowly. Hmm. Well, it's not a very big file. I don't know what happened. I don't know if, if the network on campus is uh, goofing up or if my home network is goofing up. It's stalled even. Let me try it again. Yeah, see, it somehow it just got stalled. Uh, stalled again. That could be the this is yeah, this is coming from a server off campus on campus. It could be either my either my home networks, yeah, but I don't think it is my home. I bet it's the, the server on campus is kind of stalled. That, this is uh, when we do examples in class, I'll put zip files up on the course website where we download the examples from the uh, from the server. Now I have the examples on my computer here. So if this thing won't download, I'll just grab it off of my hard drive. But, huh. Oh, what about anybody at home? If you try clicking on that link, will it download for you? Anybody, did anybody click on the link and it downloaded? Running into the same issue. Oh, yeah. if it's on campus then. So something's gone wrong with the servers on campus. Yeah, is it stalling about halfway through? Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm I just, just uh, retrieved it fully. Pardon me? I just retrieved it right now, like completely. Oh, okay. Let me uh, let me cancel and try one more time. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got it as well, Professor. Okay, and I'm yeah. going to, I'm just going to grab it off my hard drive. Okay, I'm going to cancel the download. Okay, so. Now, these are some example programs that are an introduction to your first homework assignment. Now, actually, the homework assignment is not quite there yet, but your homework assignment is going to be very similar to these examples that are in this folder. And I'm going to, we'll, we'll, in a minute, we'll talk about them. See, there's a C file, and there's some configuration file, and there's, a, there's the compiled version of this C file. There's another C program. There's the compiled version of that C program. There's a readme. A lot of times when you download a zip file, there'll be a readme that will explain a little bit about what's in that zip file. Okay, so there will be a readme to, to explain. That, that's traditional in Linux world. Whenever you give somebody a folder, you should put a readme in the folder that lets the people know exactly, you know, give a sense of what the idea is in the folder. That's an old, old tradition in the Linux, Unix world to always put a file called readme in, in, and GitHub has taken that you know, to the extreme. Now every folder in GitHub has a readme.markdown file, not, not readme.txt, but a readme.markdown file. They, they copied that into GitHub. Okay. So there'll be a, a, a read, you know, the readme explains a little bit about what's going on in there. Okay. All right. Now, so there's this reading assignment, this reading assignment, and then there's a folder of some examples. Now, if you want to compile a C program, you need a C compiler. So here is a full a zip file where I put a C compiler. I put I downloaded and, and built a small C compiler to make it real easy for you to have a C compiler at home. I don't think you need something like Visual Studio or any of these really large IDEs. In fact, you don't need them. You know, the smaller the C uh, development environment you use, the more you can learn about it. So what this is, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is going to download. If you click on this. Yeah, it's downloading pretty well. Okay. 
This is what's called the GNU C compiler. It's called GCC, the GNU C compiler. Okay. And this is the compiler that comes with Linux. That's this little symbol there. So what I did is I took a Windows version of the Linux C compiler and made it into a folder that you can just download and unzip and you have a C compiler on your computer, okay? And is it stalled again? Well, no, it's not stalled, just slow. There, okay. So there's this zip file. If you unzip this file, well, takes a little bit to unzip. The, the zip file is 40 megabytes, but it unzips to something a lot larger. It unzips to a couple hundred megabytes. So it takes a little while to unzip it. You'll only need to do this once, okay? And what you're gonna do is after you unzip it, copy it to your C folder. Now I've already done that on my computer. So here's my C drive and I copied it see, to that folder there. So I already have, I'm not going to do it again, but you copy it, you do un download this zip file, unzip it. Boy, is it, my computer is unzipping it real slowly now. After you unzip it, you copy it to this folder here. Okay. There is the compiler. And in, in this folder, I also put an editor and this is a shortcut to the editor. And I'll show you in a minute how to use this, but this is gonna be an editor that lets us use the compiler. And we're gonna use the compiler from this editor and we're gonna also use the compiler from the command line. So, but you don't have to do any install or anything like that. All you need to do is download this zip file, download the zip file, unzip it and do this one time. Okay, there, finally unzip. Okay, and then you can just cut and paste this into your C drive. Now it needs to be on your C drive. Because of the way I, I built the little compiler, I built it so that only you can't put it in any other folder. If you put it in it, if you put it in like the program files folder, it won't quite work right. So it was I designed it to be just put right under the 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 C drive. So just like I have it here. So right, just like that. Okay. All right. So download. You know, if you have if you're at a computer right now, it might be worthwhile. You can you can follow along and make sure that you feel you can do these. Download the zip file, unzip it, then just cut and paste the uh, the, zip, the unzip folder to your C drive. Okay. Now, after you've done that, you can delete the zip file. You don't need the zip file anymore unless you want to save it for some reason. Okay. And I'm going to delete this unzip one. Okay. Now, what about for uh, what about for Mac users? Oh, um, well, you Macs are Unix machines. You probably have a C compiler on your Linux. If you don't, there's a there's a C compiler for Macs. Xcode can do it, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, you would need to put Xcode. If 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 the Mac doesn't have a C compiler already on it, you'd need to download Xcode. Okay. So, what about the zip file? I no, have Xcode would... on my computer. So, what do I do about the zip file? No, that zip file is only for Windows. Okay. So just delete. All right, I'm deleting. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. I'm sorry. If you've got a Mac, don't don't download that zip file. It won't do you any good. That's a, strictly a Windows version of GCC. So you'd have to get the Mac version of GCC. And uh, you know, most people use Xcode for that purpose. Okay. All right. So now here's the folder. This is a shortcut to the edit. The edit. The compiler's in this folder. The editor is in this folder. Okay. I put a shortcut to the editor here. And what I usually do is I copy this shortcut to my desktop. But see, I already have it on my desktop. I have it over here on my desktop. And then you can just have, or you can copy it to any folder. For example, um, here's the folder that has my C code. I could copy a shortcut to this editor into that folder. Okay. Then I can close this and then now what I can do is suppose I want to see what's inside this C folder file. I can just drag it to this shortcut. There, there's that C program. Okay. That's this C program opened in this editor. 
Now, this is a simple little free editor. It's not a fancy editor. But what I did is I put tools in it for compiling your program, compiling and running. And there's you can even compile C++ programs with this, but we won't. We're, everything we're going to be doing is, is just with C. So there's the C compiler, and then there's the ability to run the program. So for example, if I delete this exe file, I can rebuild it by going here, tools, GCC, program compiled, and there's the exe back again, okay? If I have a problem with my file and I compile it, tools, GCC, I get told that there's a problem on that line. Notice that I clicked on the error message and I called, oh, there's a problem on line 20. Well, C is no different than any other programming language. Compiler error messages are always wrong. The real problem is I'm missing a semicolon up here. But because I'm missing a semicolon up here, the error shows up on the next line of code. The lack of a, because if I wanted to, the semicolon could even be go, I could put the semicolon right there. If I compile this now, C is a really, see, the error was that there was no semicolon between here and here. So when it got to the F, it said there's a semicolon missing. So the error message showed up down here. Usually we put the, C, the semicolon at the end of a line, but there's no rule that says you have to do that. You can put the semicolon anywhere you want. That's why the error messages from the compilers are often really hard to decipher because see now this, you shouldn't write code like this, but there's the, there's the semicolon that ends that line there, okay? And like I said, if I wanted to, I could put the semicolon right there and it's that's correct, but really flaky. So I should put this, now, you know, if I compile now, notice I get the error message. The error message sends me to the wrong line. You have to read the error message carefully. It says expected semicolon. Yeah, that kind of leads you to think, oh, it's probably up here is the problem. There's where the semicolon is missing, okay? Notice that this thing's, it's a fairly simple editor, but it does give you, er, it compiles your program, gives you error messages. Um, so for example, and here's another error. Okay, right now, see, it's telling me that this variable doesn't exist because I misspelled it up here. So right now it's telling me that there is no variable called FP because it was supposedly declared up here. Okay, so there's where I was supposed to declare FP. FP stands for file pointer. Okay, so now compile it, it'll run it. Okay, so this little editor lets you ru run, lets you compile C programs. Okay, and it lets, it lets you edit them and compile them at the same time. Okay, and again, you don't need to install anything. You just need to download and unzip a zip file and you, and then the, uh, the, what, the way I usually do it is after you've downloaded and unzipped that zip file, copy this Oh I, I um, Copy this thing to your don't move it. I, I, yeah, make a copy of this in whatever folder you're working in. So then you have a, a shortcut to the editor in whatever folder you're doing your work in. So then you don't even have to remember where this folder is here. You won't have to really go to it ever again. Just copy a shortcut to the editor into this folder here. Okay. Now, let me show you another way to compile this program. Like I'm gonna delete that. Okay. We can also use the command line to do things. Okay, let me close the editor. Okay, here's the folder that has the C, the compiler in it. The compiler's in this folder here. Okay, the naming is a little bit funny. Min stands for minimal. G stands for GNU. W stands for Windows. And 32 stands for the fact that this is a 32-bit compiler, not a 64-bit compiler. What it was is th this compiler was created about many years ago. It was a minimal version of GCC for Windows. So it's been abbreviated as MinGW. And people, it's a very famous project. People, a lot of companies use this for their C compiler. Instead of using Visual Studio, there's a lot, because it's the same compiler that comes with Linux, 
there's certain conveniences to using this compiler on Windows rather than Microsoft's compiler on Windows. So the name MinGW stands for Minimal GNU for Windows, except it's no longer minimal. When, it, when they first started the project, their goal was to create a minimal version of the compiler, but that was 20 years ago. At this point, it's actually a full-blown version of, of, of the GNU-C compiler, but it still carried that name. It still carries the name MinGW. Okay, and, and so now if you open this folder, this is exactly like what you would find on a Linux machine. The compiler itself is in this bin directory. The bin directory stands for binary. When Linux machines always refer to uh, folders that hold programs as binary folders, bin folders. Okay. Here is the compiler. See, that, that program there is the compiler. If I double click on it, nothing happens. If you actually open this folder and you double click on these guys, nothing happens. In fact, they actually are running. So you now here's what I'm going to do. These are command line programs. The compiler is actually a command line program. The compiler is not a GUI program. So how do I run it if I don't have a GUI like this? Like, See, this editor puts a GUI on top of the, on top of the compiler. So this editor puts a GUI on top of the compiler, but the compiler is actually a command line compiler. So how do I get access to it? Okay. So here's how we're going to do it. If you click on this address bar, th this is a weird trick. If you're at home, try doing this. Click on the address bar so that what's in it looks like that. Then type the letters CMD and then hit enter. That opens a command window in that folder. Notice that, see, I'm in the same folder. See, the folder is, uh, see, C Windows System 32.cmd. See here, C. What? Yeah, C. Huh. Well, that's interesting. It's, they're saying CMD. It's not going back to the name of the folder. Okay. Remember, so the, the trick is, in any anytime you open a folder in Windows, if you click on the address bar, you type CMD, the folder opens a command window at that folder. Okay, so I'm at the folder C, CS302, MinGW, bin, C, CS302, MinGW, bin. Now, if I type GCC, I get a little error message, GCC, no input files. So what I just did is I just ran that program. That's the compiler. If I type GCC, comma, comma, help, the compiler will tell me a little bit about itself. This is typical command line way of working. OK, a command line program will almost always tell you about itself. If you type the name of the program, then you do sometimes it's minus minus help. Sometimes it's just depends on the program. Sometimes it's just minus H. See, now this one said I don't recognize minus H. This one wants minus minus help. Some some command line programs, they use minus H for their help. Some use minus minus help. OK, and it tells you a little bit about itself. It tells you like how you talk to the compiler. And I'll show you in a second, like how you do, how you talk to the compiler. Now, right now I'm actually in this folder running this program here, okay? And oh, for example, here is the C++ compiler. So if I say G++, it complains, well, you didn't, it didn't give me an input file. If I type G++ minus minus help, it'll tell me about itself. Another thing I can say is GCC minus minus version, and it'll tell me that this is version 4.5 of GCC. Okay, and there's the copy. Free Software Foundation are the people who write the GNU compiler. This is exactly what you would see if you were on a Linux machine. And if you type GCC minus minus version, you'll see this little message here. You can also do verbose and get more information. 
here's the compiler telling me more information about itself. Okay, this stuff's pretty incomprehensible, but this is a bunch of information coming out of the compiler. Notice it's a command line program. Okay, it's not a GUI program. Here's what's one thing that's interesting. Suppose I just double click on it. What actually happens there, you don't see it, but see this error message, GCC no input files. When I double click on this, actually what happens is a window pops up with that error message and disappears almost instantaneously. If you could somehow slow windows down, you would actually see that when you double click on this, a window pops up, but it, it happens in like a, a hundredth of a second, but it actually gave me that error message. So I'm, I'm getting those error messages, but they're just disappearing right away, okay? Now, this is not a convenient way to, to use the compiler. I'm in the wrong folder. The program I wanna compile is over in this other folder. Here's the program I wanna compile. Here's where the compiler is, okay? So here's the way you work with this. The program I wanna compile is over here. The compiler is over here. What I wanna do is I wanna remember where the compiler is. It's under the folder. C, CS302, MinGW, bin, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open a command prompt in this folder, type CMD, hit enter. Now I'm in my folder of my code. If I type GCC, Windows tells me I have no idea what GCC means. I have to tell Windows where GCC is. It's in the C colon slash CS302 slash min gw folder slash bin slash gcc look oh, now i typed it wrong let's see what i did do 32 oh i'm yeah min gw i forgot the 32 there see now i got that error message no input files if i do version it'll tell me okay so now i'm talking to that compiler i'm in this folder but I'm talking to that compiler in the other folder because I tell Windows where to find it. Now, let me show you a trick. If you got a computer at home, do this. So I'll, I'll, do it this way. Type C colon slash C and hit the tab key. And hit the tab key again. Keep hitting the tab key till you get to CS302. I'm hitting the tab key and it's cycling through all the folders under the C drive that begin with the letter S, this begin with the letter C. And if I wanted to, I could type C S and hit tab, and it'll tab through these different folders, okay? Then hit slash, type the letter M and hit tab, and min GW. Hit slash, type the letter B, bin. Hit slash, type the letter G, G++, GCC. Notice I don't have to type a whole lot, okay? Yeah, so, C colon slash CS tab slash M tab slash bin tab slash GCC. Okay, and it finds the file. So this is called tab completion or command completion. It, it works exactly the same way on Linux as it does on Windows. You type a little bit and hit the tab key and the computer figures out for you what it, it finds what, you're, what it thinks you're looking for. What it does is like when I'm here, I'm at the C folder. So if I type the letter C and I hit tab, it looks in the C folder and, and cycles through anything that begins with the letter C in that folder. Okay. Oops. Then if I hit slash again and I type M, it's gonna cycle through anything with the letter M, but there's only one thing with the letter M in that folder. And then if I type B, it'll cycle through anything that begins with the letter B, okay? But there's only one folder that began with the letter B, so it doesn't matter how many, I can just hit tab and I just keep getting B. Then if I type G, now there's G, C, G++, GCC, GCC bug, G, GCOV. There's a whole bunch of programs that begin with G because it's by the people who call themselves GNU. The G doesn't stand for anything. Uh, GNU stands for G, let's see, GNU stands for GNU is not Unix. It, it's what they call a recursive acronym. It's a, it's a nonsense recursive acronym. GNU stands for G, 
G is not Unix. You, you have to understand the mentality of the people who write this code. They have very strange senses of humor. But uh, GNU are the people who helped write Linux. These are, these, these are the people who helped write the Linux operating system. Okay. So they, for, for some reason, they thought it was clever to call themselves not Unix. And I don't know, they just put the letter G in front of it. Okay, so they're not Unix because they're Linux. And, and then the G just stands for G. GNU stands for GNU is not Unix. And they, they call that a recursive acronym. Okay, funny people. Okay, so in this folder, there's a lot of things that begin with the letter G because all their programs tend to start with the letter G for the fact that they're written by GNU. Okay. Okay, now, how do I compile my C program? Notice, remember, I deleted the EXE. So I want to now tell GCC to compile something. So I say, compile incrementer. Now, I notice that I, what I did is I just typed IN and I hit the tab key. Okay, compile incrementer. But I need to tell it what the output should be. In C land, when you compile a file, if I want to, I can say, call the output. Bob. Okay. Notice I just created Bob.exe. Bob.exe is the compiled version of Incrementer. Now that's kind of a dumb thing to do, but every once in a while you want the, the name of the executable to be different than the name of the source file. Java doesn't let you do that. By definition in Java, when you compile a Java source file, the class file must have the same name as the source file. C and C don't have that rule. So when you compile something in C, you have to say, oh, what if you don't tell it what to name it? Okay. Okay. I'm not going to tell GCC what to name this file. So I'm telling it, compile that file. And it calls it a.exe. That is a famous thing about uh, this compiler. If you tell it to compile something and you don't tell it what to name the exe, it calls it a. So a.exe. Now, what we usually do is we say minus O for out incrementer.exe. Name the executable after the source code. Okay, so that's the traditional way to do it. Now, notice that I'm now I'm compiling on the command line. Now, that's different than, you know, if I wanted to, I can take this program, open it in the editor. And then I can say tools compile, okay? And then recompile this. And if I delete the exe, I can go here, tools compile, and it compiled it. Now, here's an interesting question. What's this? Now I've got three things. I've got this editor, I've got this file, and I've got this program. Let me go back to it. There's the compiler. Okay. There's the compiler in one folder. The editor is in another folder. The co program I want to edit is over here. What ties all these three things together? Okay. Click on the tools menu and click on options below at the bottom. And then click on tools again. Here's the tools that are in the editor. Click on this thing and then click edit. And here's the secret. The editor just be, is told what the command line is. See, there's the command line. And actually the command line is broken up into two pieces. The command line there and there. Now let's go back to our command line. See, I'm gonna try to line these up so you can see them. The editor is told to do exactly what it is we typed over here. We type the name GCC whoops, with its full path. See, there's the path to GCC. That's this window over here. It says command. There is the path to GCC. Okay, so there's the first part of the command line. So this part of the command line here is in this little text box over here. 
Now the other part of the command line is this part. This part's down here. Now I actually put some more stuff in here, but there's the minus O. And what this does is say, see the, the percent N? Percent N says, take the name of the file that's in this window. See, that's up here. See where my mouse pointer is? Incrementer.c. This is, this, this, essentially I'm programming the editor. I'm telling the editor to build a command line where it's gonna take the name of this file and make the output that name.exe, okay? So it's gonna compile and then it's gonna compile, whoops, find it. There, percent %f is the file that I have open in the window. So percent %f is this part here. I'm sorry, percent %f is this part here. The file that I have open in my window is incrementer.c. So when I tell the, compile, the, the editor to compile what's in this window, it puts the name incrementer.c in that variable. Percent %f is a variable. It's an editor variable. I'm actually writing a little mini programming language over here where these variable names have, these variable names are percent %f, percent %n. Percent %f is the name of this file with the extension. Percent %n is the name of the file without an extension. And then I'm building the output file is percent %n.exe. The bottom line is that the editor builds a command line and then issues that command line in a box like this, but you don't see it happen, okay? Like if I click, click cancel, I close this. Actually, it did it, here's the command, it did the command line. Actually, you can even see it right here. There's the command line. The final command line is right there. That command line is more or less the command line we typed over here. But I put some extra things, I put some extra options on that command line. We'll see later what those options are there for. But the bottom line is there's the compiler. That's this part of the command line was from here to here. Then there's some extra options. Then the minus O increment.exe is right there. And then what to compile is right there. And then there's some more extra options that we that we don't need right now. Okay. These options here, what they're for is see W stands for warning. What that's doing is it's telling me having the compiler warn me when there are certain things that I do wrong. Wait, let me give, give you an example of what I mean by that. See if I can get a warning. Um, oh, I got warnings and error. That wasn't good. I want a warning, not an error. Let me see if I can get a warning without an error. Okay, see how I got three warnings now because I commented out this include file. Okay, go back over here. Compile that file over here. Notice I only got one warning. Over here, I got three warnings. Why did I only get one warning over here? Because I didn't tell the compiler that I want all the warnings. Now, if I go here and say minus W all, now I'm telling this compiler I want all the warnings, so I got all of them. See? Now, without that option, the compiler only gives me some simple warnings. Like it only gave me the one warning. I have to tell the compiler with a com what we call a command line option. I have to tell the compiler, I want to know all the warnings. So over here in this tool, I set it so that, let me go back to it. I said I want all the warnings. Okay. Now, 
GCC is kind of odd. You think that W, notice over here, I said, I want all, W stands for warning, then I want all the warnings. Well, all the warnings is not all the warnings. For a variety of reasons, if you wanna get all the warnings, you have to say two things. You have to say minus W all and minus W extra because there's extra warnings that aren't a part of all the warnings. You have to go ask the people who wrote this program why they do it this stupidly, but minus W all is not all the warnings. If you really want to know what all the warnings are, you type minus W extra. And then that's actually still not all the warnings. If you really want to know all the warnings, then you type this thing says pedantic. Pedantic is a word meaning, you know, the, 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 the really picky little warnings. So if you want the compiler to warn you about every possible thing that could be wrong, you say minus W all, minus W extra, minus pedantic, okay? So over here, I could do that too. I could, if I wanted to, I could get even more. Now in this program, there aren't any more warnings, but I would say minus W extra and minus pedantic, okay? And now I'm being warned about everything, except that there, the, in this case, the minus W all included all the, the warnings I could get from this program, okay? You wanna know all the warnings. It's dangerous to compile C programs without warnings because you can actually have programs that don't run. C is a weird language. Programs, if you have warnings, the program may not, not behave the way you think it's going to. If you compile without, if you compile and you don't say, show me all the warnings and there are no warnings shown, it could mean your program's still wrong. You've got to see, you've got to do this thing here. You've got to say all the warnings and the extra. The pedantic's not so important, but you definitely have to have these two options in there. All the warnings and extra warnings. It's well known that a C program can have warnings in it that don't show up if you don't ask for the warnings that make your C program act incorrectly and you won't know that there's a problem. So you got to make sure that when you compile C program, especially if you do it on the command line, you should include the minus W all minus W extra. So these are called command line options. I'm saying, I want to know about the warnings. I want to know about those other warnings. I want to know about even these warnings. Okay. But I don't have to use those command line options if I don't want to. Okay. Now over here in this editor, I've written the command line one time in this little box. This is this actually the same way Visual Studio works. Uh, the comp Visual Studio is thought of as a compiler. Visual Studio is actually the GUI, like this editor, on top of a compiler. The actual compiler, even in Visual Studio, is a command line program. I think I can, I think I have it on this computer. Not sure if I remember where it is. I'm trying to find the tools. Oh, I'm trying to remember where they are. There's a folder just like GCC. Um, I don't remember where that folder is. I haven't used it in a few months and now I've forgotten where it is. But there's a folder that looks just like the GCC folder. It's a bin folder with where the actual compiler is. And then the Visual Studio GUI 
is just like this. It's got these little windows where you type in what the command line is to talk to the actual compiler, which is a GUI little a GUI program. I probably oh. No, that wasn't the right bin folder. Okay, I'll, I'll try to find it. But Visual Studio is actually set up very much like GCC is. Just like there's this folder that has all these command line programs that make up the compiler, what we call the compiler tools. Visual Studio has got a folder just like this, full of a bunch of command line EXE programs. Just like this one, GCC is the compiler. In the Windows folder, the compiler is called CL. C, I don't even know what the L stands, C stands for C. I don't know what the L stands for, but the compiler is actually called CL. Okay, And you could open a window into that you could open a command prompt into that folder and you can type commands to the uh, compiler, just like we can type commands to the uh, GCC compiler. Okay? And the Visual Studio IDE and the Eclipse IDE, they're all, they're all the same way. If you know where to dig, you'll find a box like this that shows you what command line the, the, the GUI is actually using to run the compiler program. Java is the same way. Oh, uh, for example, if I want to show you a Java system, see, there's the bin folder. There's the Java compiler. See, if I double click on that, See, oh, there you could see the, the this one you could see the black box pop up and just disappear. Okay. If I open a command prompt here, I can talk to the compiler. Notice that the Java compiler help it give if I don't give it an input file, instead of just saying you didn't give me an input file, it gives you the help message. Okay. So I can talk to the Java compiler. So now any IDE you use, like Eclipse or whatever, all it's really doing is, is exactly like this guy here. Eclipse is just an editor that's got a box. Inside that box is gonna be a command line, the text that talks to the actual compiler, which is a command line tool. And the compilers, the, there's a whole bunch, you know, in the Java world, there's a, just, like the, just like this one for GCC, oops, I'm sorry. Here's the C compiler folder. Here's the Java compiler folder. They're both full of a lot of tools. See this one here? DB stands for debugger. GDB, see? GDB, JDB. Those are the two debuggers. Those are the command line debuggers, okay? There's actually gonna be a fair amount of commonality between these things. There's, there's a fair number of things over here that have names similar to what's over here because they do similar things like DB stands for debugger and DB here stands for debugger, okay? So most programming languages are, are, are like this. The compiler is just gonna be a command line tool. The Java compiler, the C compiler, they're just command line tools. All the IDEs you use are nothing more than this editor. They're better than this editor, they're faster than this editor, but they're all designed the same way. The IDE is a GUI program that has a box in it somewhere where you tell it what the command line to use is for it to talk to the actual real compiler. Then when, when the compiler generates error messages, oh, let's, okay, let's do another, let's, let's look at another aspect of this. If I go back here and delete that semicolon, 
Okay, I got these error messages, right? Okay, now I could click on them. Well, what about in the what about in the what what do I see in the in the command line here? Okay, so let me now that program now the file's got the error in it. So if I go here and I compile it, there's my error message. See, see these three error messages are exactly these three error messages. Well, here I cannot do anything like click on an error message. The compiler just spit out, here are your problems. I asked it to compile this program. Let me short, straight, step, simplify this. Okay, I'm compiling incrementer to incrementer.exe and I've got problems. In the function main, on line 21, there's an error. And on line, so I got three errors on line 21. Now, here they're just telling me line 21. Over here, when I click on the error message, I get taken to line 21. Okay, actually, why did it say line 21? Oh, the first one's on line 20. Uh, oh, um, oh, notice that here I have one, two, three, four lines of error. Here I have five lines. I'm missing one line. Can you look real carefully? What am I missing over here? Why did I get more messages from the editor than I got from the command line? What's the missing message? The editor gave me one message that the command line didn't give me. Can you can you read it? Uh, is it clear enough to be able to read? Are you missing that ISO C for bits nested functions? Yeah. So, but look at it. what is it? It's a. Warning. It's a the warning. It's a warning. Why didn't I get it over here? Because you deleted the WL. Yeah, because I didn't ask for warnings. See, over here, I didn't ask for warnings, and so I didn't get the warning. So let me fix that. So let me go over here, and I'll put back the minus W all. Oh, I still didn't get it. So let me put the minus W extra. I still didn't get it. Maybe I need the pedantic for this one. This might be one of the examples of the pedantic. Oh, I misspelled it. Now I got even more warnings. Okay. So now I got even more warnings than I did before. But you know, I have to tell this thing to give me more. This one gave me different warnings than this one because of different options. I should be able to get the same thing. Um, get rid of. Oh, I remember. Go over here. Let's look at the tool options again. There's another option on this command line. See this one? There's many different dialects of the C language. So here I'm saying this is the most common dialect, C99. Okay. So here I'm saying use the C99 dialect. Okay. So what I now I need I didn't do that over here so that's another thing I can tell this thing I'm gonna I'm gonna tell it that I want to use the C99 dialect so I say STD um, hyphen STD so hyphen STD says I'm gonna tell it what standard version of C to use and I say equal I want to use the standard C99 okay now I hit enter and now I got 
oh, I still didn't get that warning. Huh, I'm still not, I'm, I'm a little bit baffled. I'm not sure why I'm getting a, a warning over here that I'm not getting over here. I'll have to figure that out later. But notice that how we work with this. We, we give this thing options on the command line. Okay, like here I'm saying, which dialect to see I want to use. I want those at warnings. I want those warnings also. I want to compile this file. And I want the output name to be this. Notice that my command line is getting kind of long now. So if I widen my window, it's a little bit easier to read. Okay, so there's the, what I want the output file to be. See, notice that the, the hyphen says, this is one of my options. This is the output option. This is the warning option. This is the standard option, which is saying, I want to say which standard version of C I'm using. So a hyphen says, what follows the hyphen is the name of an option. Some options are set to a value. So STD is set to the value C99. Some options you just notice that this one, you put an equal sign after the STD. Here you don't say minus W equals all, you just say minus W all. They're not consistent about how they do this stuff. So here you say minus STD equals C99. Here you say minus W all, you just write the all after the minus W. And again, here you write minus W extra. Here you say minus O space incrementer. You don't write minus O equal incrementer. You say minus space. So notice that this one uses a space. This one uses nothing. This one uses an equal sign. They're not consistent about this stuff. This is one of the reasons why command lines get a reputation of being hard to work with. The people who built these command lines weren't always real careful about consistency or logic. So you have to know all their quirky little rules, like this one uses an equal sign, this one doesn't use anything, this one uses a space, okay? So a hyphen introduces an option, then there's the name of the option, then there's a parameter to the option. The parameter can be sometimes after a space, immediately after the name of the option, or after an equal sign after the name of the option. So we say the name of the program we wanna run, we're, going to, we're running the GCC compiler, and then we give it all these options. And that's done for us in these properties in the editor. The command line's built once in here, and then I can just keep using it over and over again by having this tool up here. And again, this is how all IDEs work. This is one reason why I like to have this simple little ID. I want, I'm, what I'm trying to sh show you is like the structure of an IDE by having a simple little IDE like this, that uh, this sort of like, so a homemade IDE, it's real easy to show you the structure of it. Visual Studio is a monster of a program. Trying to explain the structure of Visual Studio is really hard. Same with, with uh, Eclipse. Eclipse is a monster of a program. Its structure is like this, but way more complicated. So here it's easy to show you the idea of the structure because it's not all that complicated. There's just this one little tool window and I can go here, tools. I can click, I got all these tools and any one of them I can just click on edit. And if I want to create new tools, you click on add and you can create your own tool. So if you want to add a tool for whatever purpose, you can add your own tools to this. Okay, And that's, you know, when I downloaded this editor, I added these tools to it. So I'm the one who put these tools in here. When you download the editor from its website, it doesn't have any tools built into it. The, the editor comes without any tools. I built uh, C tools into it. You can also build Java tools into it, Python tools into it, whatever programming language you want to use it for. So this editor, you can turn it into an IDE for any language you want. So for example, here it shows you, you can, you can turn it into edit, uh, you can, you can turn it into an IDE for almost any language you can want to. It knows about extensions. So this thing here says that this, these are the tools for your C extension. So the file here has a C extension. It, it knows about the editor when you download it, it knows about extensions, but it doesn't know about tools. So it, has, it knows about all these different extensions, like 
uh, Java, but see, there's no Java tools. The editor knows about the Java extension, but doesn't come with any built-in Java tools. So you'd have to program your own Java tools into it. Okay. All right. Now, at home, you, we're almost done. Oh, actually, we, are, we reached the end. You, you download this C compiler. Download this C compiler and make sure you can compile the examples in this folder. And what we're going to do on Wednesday is we're going to start looking at what this code does because it's the introduction to the homework, the first homework assignment. So by Wednesday, the first homework assignment should be up there. And then we'll look at this example, these example code as an introduction to the first homework assignment. And at this point, I think we're done. We, it's a quarter till one. Anybody got any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question, Professor. Mm -hmm. How are, are your office going to work this semester? Are you going to be like in, I'm in the building or is it going to be just all everything over Zoom? Um, for the first three weeks, uh, I'll do office hours. Let's see. Here, here's the link to office hours on the course, yeah, on the front page of the course website. Okay, so that's the front page of the course website. There's a link to office hours. I'll do it this way for the first three weeks. Hopefully, after three weeks, things will cut, settle down and it'll be safe to go to school and we'll be you know, able to meet in, in the office, but we'll see. I mean, I, I'm not gonna try to make a prediction for what's gonna happen after three weeks at this point. But for the first three weeks, uh, my office hours will be Tuesday, Thursday at 12.30. But as it says here, my appointment too, if you wanna meet with me, you know, send me an email. We can always make a, we can arrange a Zoom meeting. We can, you can just ask me questions by email. You know, so either send me an email, uh, come to the office hour or ask for an office hour meeting by Zoom. But for the first three weeks, we'll we'll use Zoom for office hours, okay? Awesome, thank you. Um, okay. I have a, another question. Sure. So the command line, um, is that built with Linux or is it just- that was Well, it's built in Linux and Windows both. Oh, okay, so it was both, okay. Yeah, yeah, Linux comes with it. And you know, in the case of Windows, like I say the, the, best, the best way to get to it is click on the address bar, type CMD, hit enter, and it opens a command line in that box for you. I didn't show you this, but you can also do the right, same thing. Here's another thing you do. If I right click on that box, see I have open command window here, but I had to put that in my version of Windows. You don't get that for free. So if anybody wants to, I can show you how to add that to your Windows computer, but it's really nice. You can just right click and say open command window here. That's the way I prefer to do it, but that you have to add to Windows. Windows knows this, if you click up there and type CMD, that's built into Windows. But the right click on a folder, like here on my desktop, I can right click on my desktop and say, uh, open command window here at my desktop. See, that, that, that right clicking you have to add to Windows. The, uh, the, the, the typing in the address bar, you get it for free. Okay. So the command line is there, Linux and Windows, every operating system you can imagine. Your phone has a command line. If you really get curious about this, you can open a command line to your cell phone. It's the Android operating system and the Android operating system has a command line. And, and if you wanna hack your phone, you can open a command line into your Android cell phone. All operating systems have a command line. Any other question? Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to stop the meeting, and hopefully later on this afternoon there'll be a, a link to the, this video up on on the course website. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Take care, professor. Oh, professor.